guest today is Paul McDonald. He is a retired professor emeritus from psychology at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, specialist in autism spectrum disorder, and has a musical side to him too, which we'll explore later on in the show. Welcome. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, could we start with your professional career or former career in autism? And actually, you sit on a national board now. There was recent media coverage oh, yeah. that you uh, sit somewhere high up in the structure for autism. Well, not really. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a, a, a consultant with Autism Canada, okay. which is a real pleasure to be part of that organization, actually. I enjoy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you help the audience right from the start have an appreciation for the work you do in autism? We know it through how the media will portray moments um, when that comes into the public fray, and maybe that, that's not as deep an understanding as we could hmm. benefit from. I guess, uh, you know, I was, a, I was, when I started doing clinical psychology in the, really in the late 80s, uh, so that's a long time ago, uh, when I think about it. Uh, I mean, I, I guess uh, at that point, I, I was focusing on children. Uh, I was a child psychologist. Uh, uh, many of the uh, children that came to see me, uh, it turned out there was a very high incidence of autism. So I became increasingly interested in autism as a diagnosis. And uh, so... Um, and along the way, I met a lot of incredible parents, you know, who were struggling with the issues related to autism and helping their children to develop properly. And, uh, and I was so impressed, I think, with some of the parents that I met that I thought, you know, these people are very strong. They're really, they're really uh, doing everything they can. They're turning over every stone. They're working so hard. And so I kind of wanted to be part of that, uh, that effort, you know. And uh, so I got invited to do talks on autism and eventually uh, just started reading more about it, doing more work in the field. Uh, of course, I was seeing children clinically, so that, that helped as well mm -hmm. to inform what I was doing. And um, one of the, But then, of course, what was really exciting at that point was that there was some research out there that really showed that autism was treatable to some extent and that there were effective methods for treating it, evidence-based methods that actually were available. And so I think I sort of felt like a lot of people don't know about this. And we have to make people aware of what is possible, what is available out there. Yep. So that's what that's what I was doing. COVID. Can you um, give us a definition or a description of autism? Um, autism is a developmental disorder and uh, probably uh, mostly genetic in origin. Uh, and uh, it uh, really is a disorder that affects three areas of functioning, particularly uh, uh, social development. Uh, it also, though, related to that, I guess, is, is, is communication skills. So um, in some cases, at one extreme, you might have a, a child who has no language at all and does, literally doesn't speak to a child who has language and probably fairly good vocabulary, but has a tremendous difficulty with conversation, you know, so it, it runs that whole gamut. Uh, so that's communication. Uh, the social part is, of course, related to that, and there's a real difficulty for many individuals on the spectrum in engaging in reciprocal interactions, you know, with, with people. So again, a conversation is the prototypical social situation. We're having a conversation right now, and probably many people with uh, with on the autism spectrum would find this type of face-to-face, -face, uh, open-ended conversation to be very difficult. A more structured conversation would be okay, but but for them that would be a challenge, I think. And uh, then the third sort of component is. Um, and probably it's partly related to the, the presence of the social issues, is that there's a preference for sameness, there's a preference for, the, there's a tendency to be rigid, there's a tendency to engage in sort of repetitive behaviors of one sort or another, or to find uh, fascination in particular aspects of the sensory environment, uh, which kind of lock them into uh, repetitively uh, stimulating themselves with those kinds of things. Like you could see a child sitting on a playground and instead of playing with, 
the materials are in the playground, the child is sifting sand repeatedly and doing this over and over again. So that repetitive behavior is, is sort of the background in, in, the, in the diagnosis, I think. When you gave the image of sifting the sand, um, I want it to be light but in depth at the same time. With uh, Would that be like Rain Man in the movie Rain Man where the match, matches fall down and he knows the number of the matches right away because it appears whole? Yeah. But then to communicate it's sort of another challenge. And uh, that's a Hollywood movie and all. Yeah. But that focus on what they might be seeing might be ten times more powerful than what you know, well, we're just sifting sand through our hands. And maybe they're catching every grain as it goes whistling. It's a, that is a possible I suppose. <laughs> but but uh, typically yeah, I suppose that's possible. Uh, typically we don't see a lot of examples of this sort of incredible uh, sort of skill like that that Rain Man showed. I mean, I, I have seen actually uh, some individuals on the spectrum who did have those kinds of yeah. unique skills, but that's pretty rare. That's yeah. not typical. A, a neighbor yeah. of mine a few years ago um, had a son, have a son, yeah. and uh, his thing, when the Zellers was still open in Fredericton on the north side, um, he would count the lights Okay. And and would know which ones were out from which the last time. Yeah, yeah, um, another friend, um, the dad had... Uh, um, hockey cards going back yeah. 20 or 30 years and would have fun playing with the sun at nighttime playing them out absolutely but they had to be a particular way absolutely and yeah. and would remember every card in and that that's rigidity they had to be a particular way and if you disturbed that they'd he'd probably be upset with you about that <laughs> right yeah so yeah. i guess i was trying to slide to there's a talent set buried in that struggle to communicate mm -hmm. what's going on well, the thing is, is that individuals on the autism spectrum uh, may have developmental uh, limitations in, in cognition and in, in, in thinking, uh, but they may not, too. So we have many who are extremely bright, uh, but, but there's a lot in the middle of the range, too. So in, just like we have in, in people who don't have a diagnosis, then, you know, you have a range of abilities. However, there is a fairly high percentage that would have significant impairments intellectually. And so we have to keep that in mind too. And so the, the in a way they but all of the, there are challenges all along the spectrum. There are different challenges along the spectrum, but there are definitely challenges all along the spectrum. I know a lot of normal or typical people that would fit. <laughs> so oh, yes. you know, because yeah. whenever we put that lens on it, they say, "Well, yeah, we could say that about society in general. We we we've, mm -hmm. we've got some challenges we need to overcome." So it just sets the. Yeah, I think I think we're all uh, we're all challenged in ways. You know, we all yeah. have r r rigid behaviors. We all have have these things. It's just that in, in the person on the diagnosis, they have enough of them that it makes it may interfere with their life in some way. It yeah. may make it difficult for them to navigate through the social world. Yeah, you know, which then sets up how how we work with this mm -hmm. and how we help others work with this, which is maybe right. the ABBA program or something else. ABA, yeah. Applied, Maybe, applied, applied behavior analysis. Yes. Yeah. So can you speak a bit to the tools that are available now and how much they've evolved so that we can build bridges to reach? Yeah, I think uh, applied behavior analysis is, uh, is a wonderful sort of evidence-based way to go about treating uh, not only autism but many other issues as well because basically what applied behavior analysis is is a way to teach people skills. And uh, so many of the individuals on the autism spectrum, the problem is because of the autism, their rate of learning is lower than it would be in a typical person. And so the point of applied behavior analysis is to optimize the learning that they do. You know? And so they, the, the idea is that uh, if we can design a learning situation in which that child is going to be learning at a rate that is somewhat comparable to what a typical child would learn, then we're really going to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you kind of imagine that uh, your typical child, without any effort at all, is learning constantly throughout the day. And I mean, literally, this is actually true. If you look at the number of interactions that a typical child has with its environment, in which they have the chance, opportunity to learn something, it's probably happening every hour of the day. And in contrast, the child on the spectrum is not actually doing that. That when we watch them and observe them, we see that a lot of their repetitive behaviors lock them into one thing and they're doing this for a long period of time or they're doing nothing at all. Hmm. Or the interactions they're having are not productive interactions. They may be ones that they're, it's creating a problem for them. They may be getting into a temper tantrum. 
uh, which results in a prolonged temper tantrum, which results in them having a, a negative interaction with, uh, say, the parents, you know. So they're not really learning the kinds of things that we want them to, and they're certainly not learning at the rate we would like to see that child learn. So in the course of a week, uh, you've got um, how many hours? I don't know, 190 hours a week or something like that. Uh, your typical child is probably learning most of those hours are being used. Some, obviously, they're asleep for some of them, so okay. when they're awake, they're actually learning. And your typical child on the spectrum is probably not learning for a lot of those. Some vary, of course, depending on the child. Hmm. But so the goal of intervention, I think, from my perspective, is to increase the rate of learning, basically. And that's what applied behavior analysis has effectively done. So, for instance, in the original research, they uh, happened to choose 40 hours a week of therapy, if you want to call it. Now, actually, what that really was is 40 hours a week with a teacher, basically. It's really what it boils down to. Yep. And, uh, but the teacher was trained. The teacher was following a program. The teacher was uh, optimizing the learning for those children while they were with them. And uh, what they found in the research, this was back in 1987, was done by Dr. Ivar Lovas at the University of California, Los Angeles. And what Lovas found was that uh, uh, if you can provide a consistent and optimal learning environment, that a significant number of the children who went through the program uh, became almost indistinguishable from typical children. Not totally, but they came very close to it. Certainly, uh, they made significant gains in intellectual development, significant gains in adaptive development, and their social skills dramatically improved. So the kind of statistic that uh, Lovas was quoting in, in, his, well, in the research is that roughly about 40 to 45 percent of the children became indistinguishable from a typical child. And the others, you know, would, would get more or less, they come up with different amounts of yep. improvement, but they were all doing doing better. There were some that showed very little responsiveness to the treatment, but that was a very small number. So that research has been repeated and replicated many times over uh, in many different ways, in many different sort of environments and laboratories around the world. And generally, uh, it has been has been confirmed that that can actually take place. So. That's the good news. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's great news yeah, yeah. that we have uh, an intervention that can be extremely effective and uh, under ideal conditions. The trick is, of course, is to create those ideal conditions. The trick is to to have uh, a way to provide the services. You know, and that of course costs money, and uh, and uh, so there are issues there. Yeah. But uh, in New Brunswick, we've done reasonably well. You know, with this and. Uh, are there alternative treatments? There's, you know, there, there, there are, mm -hmm. um, but uh, most of the alternative treatments are not evidence-based. Uh, there are many things that are held out to the public as a treatment. Uh, I think a lot of them are scams, frankly. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things out there that are, uh, are uh, in fact, I would say in the, in the field of autism, there's sort of like a, uh, a new fad treatment is available almost every week we hear something so but beyond that there are um, there are uh, developmental approaches there are uh, some uh, speeches involving uh, language and communication which are, are uh, I think effective in some sense I sort of see all of these things as merging together that, that they're all aiming at a lot of the same things really but. Do you have any um, personal stories you might share of a family you worked with or a person you worked with that would um, kind of give it an example of, of the structure you've now taught us and, and built for us? Hmm. That we have this tool, it's been well documented, it's, it's been proven to work. Mm -hmm. It does take ideal conditions. New Brunswick will have its particular challenges, which we'll get into in, in a bit. Mm -hmm. But it would be nice to hear if uh, he had some hands on mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the human. Base of it, no names, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, sure, just... of course. No, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, as I say, the thing we talk about the autism spectrum. So there is, of course, a spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, uh, symptoms, uh, severity of symptoms. We see 
uh, individuals who uh, really have very little um, skill at all, uh, so quite impaired in terms of their development. On the other side, we have individuals who are um, we typically we used to refer to them as Asperger's, uh, high-functioning autism. These are individuals who may get university degrees, mm -hmm. but they still have some of the characteristics, the social anxiety, they have uh, some of the repetitive rigid behaviors, you know. So you have a whole whole spectrum in there. Um, I don't know, I, I can think of a, lot, a number of, uh, of clients that I worked with that were particularly uh, interesting to me. Uh, one that I can think of is a young girl who, who came for assessment to me uh, years ago, and she was very, very passive, and that's one of the expressions of autism. In her case, she was passive in the sense that she didn't respond to me when I talked to her. She, she sat in the corner. She didn't want to play with toys. She just she wasn't upset particularly. She was just disinterested in me, disinterested in the world around her, um, not responding, and clearly not learning in that situation. So she went, uh, we did the assessment, we, we calculated the um, scores on the developmental tests that we had, and she was functioning pretty low. And uh, by all accounts, uh, looking at, at the, uh, the history provided by the parents, you know, you could see that uh, she, she was not able to accomplish uh, much in terms of adaptive skills in the real world. Um, she, after the uh, assessment and the diagnosis, uh, she entered into the Autism Intervention Services Program that we have in New Brunswick. And uh, this provides 20 hours a week of applied behavior analysis uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, so she was in that and she I think at the time that I saw her initially, I think she was probably around two years of age, two to maybe two and a half. And so she went into the intervention program, and I didn't see her for quite a while, but I guess about, <clears throat> actually we were making a film, I think, about uh, how to teach people, uh, how to train people in applied behavior analysis techniques, and uh, uh, her family volunteered to be subjects in the film, so they came in for that. And it was really interesting because when she came, she she had developed a language. She uh, she was now talking. Uh, she was very robotic, I would say, and uh, uh, and 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 was limited in what she could say. But but she had language, and this was, seemed to me to be fantastic. You know, uh, she. Um, uh, she was able to um, sit and, and interact with a therapist and uh, to engage in a variety of tasks, uh, could, could answer questions, and uh, this was pretty good. Anyway, that, I saw her then, and then I think about a year later, <clears throat> maybe it was about a year later, a year and a half later, she came back for a follow-up assessment. Then when she came back, she showed up at the door of my office, you know, and she had a smile on her face, which was unbelievable. I'd never seen her do that, you know. Uh, she came in, she said, where should I hang my coat? I was like, oh my, we have really gone somewhere with this job. Where am I going to hang my coat? I was thrilled. Well, you can just hang your coat right there, you know. <laughs> she was just sweet. And then she said, well, you know, what are we going to play? And I said, okay, well, let's go in, let's go play. And so we went into the room we had and we a lot of toys and things. She said she wanted to play taxi, and she said, uh, I'll be the driver, and you, she was telling me how we're going to play this game. Um, but, and we're, we're, so we were in the taxi, and we're driving along, and she says, would you like some music? He clicks the radio. And she, the point is, she was engaging in pretend play. You know, it's she powerful. Was, it was just powerful, yeah. And, and it was the fluidity and, and the spontaneity of her behavior that day that really thrilled me, you know, that that was what was different. I didn't, at the halfway point, when I had seen her a year and a half before that, she hadn't quite got there. She had developed a lot of the basic skills, but she hadn't quite made the, the grade to that next level. But it was at that point that I saw her that last day, I thought, you know, she's made it. You know, she's, as, she's getting very close to what you'd expect for a typical child of that age, you know. So that was pretty exciting, you know. It's, that's terrific. It also sounds like... Um, <clears throat> 
she gained a measure of confidence. Yes, that's really true. Yeah, and her social confidence. And that was the thing, you know, she really was, she had picked up how to do social stuff, you know, how to, how to, how to talk to me, you know, where should I hang my coat, you know, mm. would you like some music? You know, isn't that amazing, you know? Yes. So that's, and I think that's what a lot of us feel when we work in this field, that when you have an intervention technique that you use and it works and you see that child learning, mm. that is pretty darn exciting. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>